And coming up on today's Green Signals Your Railway podcast, Flying Scotsman, the world's most famous steam locomotive, is to have a new custodian. But what is a custodian? Who are they? What do they do? And what will it mean in practice? The good old Jacobite steam train operator West Coast Railway Company is fitting central door locking after all, but only to Mark IIs, it seems. Very peculiar. Lumo trains and the divisive issue of open access. Richard interviews managing director Martin Gilbert and things get a bit lively. Good stuff. And some good news. The Ecclesbourne Valley Railway is due to fully reopen. Welcome to Green Signals from me, Nigel Harris, here in Lincolnshire. And as per usual... Uh, from me, Richard Bowker, um, here in sunny Wiltshire. Jolly good. few changes, Richard. I'm loving the new studio. Bit of railway honour going on there in the background. Plus, is that a tidied up, genuine flame-cut cab side off a of 40? It, it is, yeah. Well, Mrs Bowker, I think, was getting a bit cheesed off with me using up um, camping out in the dining room, which is actually was a fair point. So we've got, I've tidied up this little room we've got. It's a bit white, so I thought, well, I'll put some sort of railway stuff. So, yep, um, we've got, uh, if you're listening on um, audio, by the way, you'll just have to use your imagination with this. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've got a British Railways uh, carriage uh, transfer that was... The roundel um, with a red Walton lion. Carriageways. Yep, which was given to all the members of the Strategic Rail Authority in 2005. Uh I've got a rather lovely picture of an Edinburgh tram, which a certain N. Harris gave me uh, on my appointment at the Strategic Rail Authority. So I won't tell you how many years ago that was, Nigel. Uh, and yes, that is a genuine flame cut from the finest member of the finest class of locomotive ever built. That's 40035 Apapa. There you go. I like those liner names tucked away in the middle. Lusitania. Yeah, they were great. Yeah. They, were, they were really good. Okie dokie. So that's really good. So that's going to be permanent, is it? Or will the railway, railway honour display change over, do, over time? Because I'm sure you've got lots well, of stuff you could put there. I do have quite. Yeah, actually, that's a great idea. I think over time I might, you know, ring the changes. Oh, there you go. Good point. But apart from the Edinburgh tram picture, of course, you know, but uh, that ought to be a fixture. <laughs> so before we go any further, we begin with our usual shout out um, to the kind souls who's given us super thanks via YouTube and bought us a coffee or two. They go down really well, especially in our own mugs. This week, not for the first time, we need to thank Stephen Pritchard. We're incredibly humbled that some of you have left us super thanks more than once now. It always gives us a real buzz when we get them, so thank you. I wonder if it'll work in person, Richard, if they ever see us in a pub. Oh. Oh, well, that would, that would be extremely uh, welcome. So, yeah, I think we might have to go to a railway pub somewhere, but no, we might have and to try see, that. see what happens. Okay. We've also got a little update, actually, on last week's show, Nigel. Um, if you remember, we weren't 100% clear on how to pronounce the name of Avanti's, um, Avanti West Coast's uh, Hitachi, the new Hitachi trains. So we're very grateful. Their head of news, Rob Singh, has been in touch and uh, and confirmed that the correct pronunciation is Evero. Evero. Yeah. That's good. And just in passing about pronunciation, I noticed the um, the Tartan Pronunciation Police um, flamed me out for getting Leaven Mouth, Leaven Mouth wrong. And one or two remarks about if there's online resources, why don't you use them? Well, we did. We listened to three and they all said Leaven Mouth. So that's what we went with. So right. there. Touchy, touchy. Okay, moving on. Well... <laughs> I'm, I'm the first to admit I could get something wrong, but when we have actually taken the trouble to look. But there you go. Let's move on. Let us move on. Before we get to the big topic of our show, open access and our interview with Lumo and Hull Trains MD Martin Gill, but we want to talk a bit about a topic that even people not interested in railways at all have all heard of usually. Ask anyone which is the most famous steam locomotive in the world, and the chances are the winner by a country mile would be LNER A3 Pacific number 4472. Depending on which area you favour, it could be 60103 Flying Scotsman. The locomotive celebrated its centenary in 2023, and its ability to draw the crowds shows no sign of slowing down. It is an amazing crowd puller. Its history has not been without occasional controversy, mind you. It was nearly lost to the nation. 
um, as part of its ill-fated trip to the United States in the late 1960s when Alan Pegler owned it and it was rescued by Sir William McAlpine and brought back, I think, in 1973. Um, it had a hugely expensive rebuild not that many years ago that wasn't that well managed, it has to be said, that ran into millions of pounds. And there are constant fears that the behaviour of quite a few people trying to get line-side photographs and ignoring pretty much every safety regulation in the book could see the locomotive have to become a static exhibit. There have been some very, very close shaves. It's owned nowadays, of course, by the National Railway Museum at York, who grant custodianship to a third party who then looks after and operates the locomotive on behalf of the museum and us as taxpayers, it has to be said, it's a public asset. Until recently, that has been very well-known steam locomotive engineer, Ian Riley, up there in Bury in Lancashire, who's second to none as an engineer, as an operator. But the NRM recently carried out a fresh competitive tender after Ian's contract expired to appoint a new custodian. And this time, a different company has been appointed, Northern Steam Engineering Limited. I have to say, I'd never heard of them. So we asked the NRM about these changes, and although they were really kind in answering our questions really very promptly, they also said it's too early to answer most of our questions, which struck me as a bit odd, but there you go. But here's what they were able to tell us, and there are five points. So shall we just cycle through them, Richard? Yeah, I, I, I agree, because there's some different stuff here, isn't there? All right. The con point one, the contract with Northern Steam will, will be signed in due course. The contract award notice containing details of the award will be published via the Contracts Finder portal, which is a government site, I think, once the contract has been signed. So you've got lots of experience in this sort of area, Richard. What do you reckon? Well, it was odd this when we chatted about this the other day, wasn't it? Because the contract... Uh, find a portal as you say you can go on to a, a government website it's actually very good you type in the search term you know flying scotsman whatever and it threw nothing up I thought, that's really weird um there was nothing there there was stuff relating to flying scotsman from last year so i thought oh, well it's not that it's rejecting the search term the, the, the latest contract's just not there and it is a bit odd that um they've announced something without that being Signed. I'm not surprised it's not on the portal because that's just an uploading matter. But they say the contract's not been signed, which, yeah, okay, a bit, a bit, a bit strange. But I'm, I'm because they I'm don't sure use that... the term heads of agreement or anything. It's just no. not signed. No, that's a good point. They don't, they don't talk about that. But you know, I'm sure it's in a finally agreed form. But okay. they say it's not been anyway, signed. Yeah. Point two, and if you'll bear with me, I'm going to do point two and three together, and you can discuss them together. So here's point two. We have no news to share on who the operator will be on the main line at the moment or where the locomotive will be based. It will take time to establish the relationship and develop the calendar. That's point two. And point three, this is the NRM. We were impressed by Northern Steam's skills and commitment to working across the rail sector to bring Flying Scotsman to the largest audience possible. All bids had their strengths but Northern Steam operations were ultimately the chosen provider. Pick the bones out of that. Well, I'm actually great that you did put those two together because it's it's odd, isn't it? So they've said, we've, um, we've no news on who the operator is going to be. So uh, Northern Steam is going to be the custodian. We'll look after the engine from, I guess, from a technical and engineering point of view. But as to who's going to be operator, we don't know. And where it's going to run on the main line so that the public can see it, we don't know yet. And then they say, we were impressed by Northern Steam skills and commitments of working across the rail sector to bring Flying Scotsman to the largest audience possible. I don't understand how those two things um, line up. No. If you don't know who the operator is and you don't know where it's going to be based, how can you be impressed by someone's commitment to make it, bring it to the largest audience possible? Didn't quite make sense, those two things. Okay, point four, we cannot confirm who the other bidders were. I take it that applies even though this is public information and a public property and a public procurement. We're not entitled to know who the other bidders were. It's a really good question, that. Um, often shortlisted bidders lists are made public. Um, they've. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to this because some of the rules have changed over the past few years. 
as to whether or not you're now entitled to keep them confidential or whether I, I don't know. I mean, I I'm sure they followed the process correctly, but yeah, it would have been nice to know. But I suppose there's a bit of me is not entirely surprised. Do you? I mean, it, it would it would have been good, but it, yes, we just would like to know who it was, wasn't yeah. it? Um, and I was pleased to see point five. Well done, the NRM, for making a point of stressing that they wanted to thank Riley and Son for the commitment and quality of service over the past ten years with Flying Scotsman. Um, <laughs> Ian Riley is a lively character who isn't afraid to let people have the truth. I'm reminded of that famous scene in A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholson yells across the courtroom at Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> well, that's a bit Ian, is that? Um, but he's a first-rate engineer, and he's a very experienced operator, and I think Ian is second to none in that kind of thing. So it's entirely right they should they should thank him. Um, and I do wish Northern Steam well. Flying Scotsman is a well-known bringer of trouble to your doorstep. Um, and it will doubtless continue to be so. So I do wish him well. There is one aspect to the uh, the announcement which made my jaw drop, and that's the NRM's implied intention or willingness to consider, or the, the, it's actually in the agreement with the operator to provide for converting it back to a single exhaust, a single chimney. Now, I don't really want to get into all the... Um, technicalities of it but if you listen to the peter townend tribute that were recorded which is still on the website on youtube peter explains how the work he did in the late 50s and early 60s fitting double carl chap exhausts to the a3s transformed the performance they were able to fill in on deltic slots when the deltics weren't available they used less coal less water they ran more freely they were wonderful and i actually talked to peter about this because there were one or two historical aficionados who, uh, oh, it should be back to single chimney. And, of course, that's what Alan Pegler did when he bought it. He had Doncaster put it back to single chimney. But Peter was scathing him. He said, why would you want to hamper the performance and damage it, downgrade it so much when you're out on the main line, when you need it to be running to the best? Yeah. And that still applies even more now. The idea of letting an engine out with a single exhaust or detuning it to that degree I can't understand why an anybody would want to do uh, that. Uh, it's an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, uh, is this the difference between preservation and conservation and restoration? You know, I mean, I, the, the people who are into all this stuff say, yeah, they're all different things. But, I mean, I would have thought, it, you know, in the... When when was when was that done in the fifties when Peter did that? I think it was either very late fifties or early sixties. Right. Well, why that he improved it so oh. you conserve or you preserve what you've got today? Why do you just go back to something else? It make I, I, I'm 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 with you completely. It doesn't make it, any sense. And on today's railway, when the last thing you want is any kind of threat to performance, yeah. um, it just seems. It seems yeah. madness. And you just touched yeah. on the important point for me. The, oh, the There's endless arguments about whether Flying Scotchman should be in Apple Green or LNER livery or whatever, or BR Blue. In the form it's in now, with the little German smoke deflectors and the double cowl chap exhaust, the only correct livery for it is BR Brunswick Green. And you and I talked about this off screen the other day, about like listing buildings. A building is listed as it is at the time it's listed, even if it's got a little extension on the end, and that you have to conserve it in that form. So, yeah. if you apply the conservation argument, it needs to stay exactly as it is. Interesting. I think. I think that that final sentence, Nigel, has just guaranteed about a thousand YouTube comments. So, excellent. <laughs> I, d I did a big feature when I was editing Steam Railway about this very subject, and I came up with one of the headlines I've been I've been proudest of. It was stir thoroughly before application, <laughs> um, and it did generate lots and lots and lots of response. So rush to your keyboards and let us know. Um, and speaking of controversy and the gift that keeps on giving, let us move on to the Jacobite Steam Train um, with further developments there. Last week, we mentioned that ORR had said they'd advise West Coast Railways of the outcome of their recent Mark I exemption application um, and offered West Coast Railways the chance to comment on it before it was made public, um, which seemed to suggest to us the answer had been no, yes, because otherwise, why would you comment? But anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Richard, you have what we could <laughs> I suppose laughingly call an update. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get too excited. Uh, um, I might have added a bit more fog to an otherwise misty. Um, but it, well, thank you very much. 
What, are you talking about this or just generally, right? Well, I was thinking about the quiz. We'll serve it till then. Well, indeed. I can't wait. <laughs> right. So we asked ORR um, how long um, West Coast Railways had been given to consider um, what ORR told them. Um, and they didn't answer that, uh, which is a bit of a shame, but because it would have been useful, you know, have you given them a week, two weeks, what? But they did say this, all right? We're in discussions, oh, sorry, we are in discussions with the West Coast Railways about the findings from our review of the company's application for an exemption, which we kind of knew, right? But it does rather suggest that if they're in discussions about it, it it's probably not entirely what West Coast Railways really wanted. But anyway, that is a bit of speculation. But we did then notice a curious comment on the West Coast Railways website dated the 5th of June in which West Coast Railway said, today we have announced some additional cancellations of trips for the afternoon service, the 12.50 departure from Fort William. The cancelled trips are now from the 6th of May to the 16th of June um, inclusive. And then further down, and in bold, it says, we are planning to start the Jacobite afternoon service this month, departing 12.50, but due to the amount of work necessary to fit the CDL, Ooh. central door locking, we cannot guarantee which date the service will start. As soon as the date is confirmed, we will inform passengers directly and announce it on the news articles. At which point, we, we all thought, unsurprisingly, wow, they're going to fit CDL to the Mark 1 carriages. They've capitulated. Big well, we, news. It, well, indeed we did, and it would indeed have been massive news, <laughs> if uh, correct. So uh, back on the phone uh, or email, we asked West Coast Railways to confirm uh, that they were doing that, and they said, no. Um, the CDL we're fitting is to mark two carriages. It's important to remember, the, the regulations relate to hinged, you know, it's hinged door stock, which obviously mark two is um, as well as a mark one. So they said, we're, um, we're fitting a CDL to mark twos, but we're still seeking an exemption for mark ones. Now, that kind of really did have us all kind of, you know, like scratching our heads because... Um, Regular listeners will recall that uh, West Coast Railway's position, which they've been very clear about, is that they think their approach of putting secondary door bolts, basically, and using stewards and so on, uh, which they've risk assessed and they've had that verified, that um, they say, uh, is sufficient. Well, if you think it's sufficient, surely it's sufficient for everything you operate, not just one kind of carriage as opposed to another. So why say you want you're going to fit cdl to one but not to the others it it doesn't really it doesn't feel logical at all to me that but but there you go it's all it, a bit confusing it really doesn't make sense and um there was a piece was it twitter or youtube where somebody mentioned this last couple of days seen a rake of cdl fitted mark twos heading north for fort william and with a balancing rake of non-CDL fitted coaches heading south to yeah. Carnforth. So they're obviously fitting CDL. Yeah, that was Lesda Gilpin, who's based in Carlisle, who um, it, I don't think anything moves through Carlisle without uh, Leslie seeing it. <laughs> this is great. And understanding um, what it is by the sound of it. And absolutely it? understanding what it is, which is actually very helpful. So that was a very helpful observation. Um, yeah, it, so they're clearly fitting it uh, on something and, 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 and moving stuff around. I guess we won't really know the answer to any of this until until what the ORR have said becomes public. Right. And at that, I guess we must leave it for the time being and move on to Indeed yet so. another controversial subject. Very divisive, open access, which we know you're not a huge fan of, Richard. At the top of the programme, we said we had our big feature on today's show was one of the more divisive issues, the question of open access. Is it a good thing? Bad thing? Or perhaps a bit of both. Richard interviewed one of the strongest advocates for open access around on Britain's railways, Martin Gilbert, Managing Director of First Group's Open Access Operations, which includes Lumo and Hull Trains. It was a comprehensive interview that pulled no punches and got a bit lively <laughs> here and there as well. It was I great. It was good. I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> it um, because he's he's a real live wire, isn't he? And an answer for everything and instantly, you know. Um, now, because the interview is 30 minutes in total, as I said, got a bit lively, a bit long, we don't have time to play the entire interview now. We've just got the headlines, although they are brilliant on their own. However, 
we've put the full interview, or we're going to put the full interview on both our Spotify channel as a special, and you can listen to it on your podcast provider of choice, as well as on our YouTube channel when it appears there as a special video in which all the details are fully ventilated. So do listen to it if you can. Um, Richard and Martin talked in, in detail about topics such as Martin's early career and what got him interested in open access because he's in buses for a long time, wasn't he? Yeah, how bus. Hull Trains is bouncing back post-pandemic and how Lumo is doing since launch. The really big problematic issues that open access raises, Labour's policy for open access and what Martin thinks of that, and their plans for more open access services in the future. They haven't done yet if it's left to Martin. It's all brilliant stuff, very interesting. But during the interview, Richard tackled Martin on his five key more problematic issues that open access raises. And here's how they got on. Let's let's talk about open access perhaps more as a as a general set of principles, okay, rather than which is always what I try to do rather than sort of any you know, picking on one particular operator. And there's probably a few key points that I think it's worth bringing out. We've got sort of five principles. They're not in any particular order, these, although the first one is probably perhaps the most emotive or certainly the biggest. And that's the question of abstraction. So well, there's a view that um, when an open access operator comes onto the network, there is abstraction. And that can take a number of forms. It can either be through the ORCAT system um, in terms of interavailable tickets, because obviously you have to sign up to the ticketing selling agreement and, and, and accept interavailable tickets. So that gives you a chunk of money. But then also there's just the reality that people migrate over from um, you know the existing operator on, onto you. And this can be a very big number, as we've seen from the ORR's analysis. Surely that's a subsidy by any other name. Well, I think the world's moved on, I would say, in terms of how people buy and retail tickets. The OR report that you talk about is, is, is pre-pandemic and quite a few years before that. I think it was 2016 that they, they had that research commissioned. Um, and uh, certainly even the OR, um, you know, in more recent uh, activities, uh, certainly uh, can see um, that, that abstraction is, is not the big thing um, that it used to be in terms of the sort of whole all-cats position. We're, we're long-distance operators. The bulk of our customers buy a specific ticket for a specific train. The revenue um, is lying where it falls. Um, and certainly, if you look at what's happened with, with, with recent changes to LNER's ticketing as well, um, that's only amplified that further. And in terms of where we travel today with a more, or where we are today with a more leisure-focused market, it is all about the vast purchase fares. That the all cats revenue is 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 a no. Far, I, 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 I accept I accept that Martin on on all cats and certainly on on longer distance operators. It will be much more around advanced purchase. So the interavailable elements um, smaller. To totally um, accept that. I'm I'm also really talking about other forms of abstraction. I mean, let's let's take an example that's not yours, right? So let's look at the recent Grand Union application to go to Sterling, which was approved. The ORR's own analysis, so this isn't 2016, this is now, said the gross abstraction on that would be £24.4 million per annum. Now, some of that's going to be all cats, but most of that's simply going to be taking business off of anti-West Coast. So that I, I kind of go back to my previous question, really. That, in any other, you, you can't really describe that as anything other than subsidy, because... Whereas the revenue risk was taken by the franchisee pre-COVID, it's now taken by the Secretary of State. Well, I can't talk about other operators' open access applications. What I can say is in terms of the two that I look after here in terms of our current operations, we are very, very clear that we believe that where we sit today, you know, I approached at the start the numbers about customer number recovery and now growth, that actually we are generating sufficient trips. Yes, there is movement between operators. You know, people go online because that we have impartial retailing regulations in the sure. in the country, which we really support. Um, that people may have a intended to travel with Company A, see a fare for Company B, and switch. But actually, there is a whole greater piece around there that what we're doing in terms of open access, bringing in some healthy challenge and competition to the market, helping to keep fares keen for customers. I mean, you know, Lumo is offering. You know, really, really, really great uh, value for money that's making it uh, competitive against low-cost airlines um, and uh, even intercity coach travel and making people rethink um, about driving and also just opening up new journey opportunities. You know, I hear from people that say, 
you know, we, we wanted to go and see this show or this football match, but actually, you know, the, the, the cost of the journey was, was we, we felt would be too expensive to justify it. They've actually come on and seen a, a headline £26 fare and gone, oh, do you know, actually, we can justify doing this. So, and, 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 and it can be no coincidence when we talk about those numbers. You know, COVID's given us a sort of reset in terms of customer numbers that the East Coast Main Line is bucking the trend. Um, you know, the whole long distance market, if you look at last year's LOR stats, is 13% down. Yet yeah, East Coast Main Line, everything is up in terms of that. Those those so, London focus journeys. So I don't, I go on, sorry. don't want to put words in your mouth, so you can tell me whether this is right or not. You, your argument is, even if um, there is an element of Luma, let's take Luma as, as an example, of um, taking customers that were on LNER and are now going on Lumo, notwithstanding that, the whole market for everybody is now bigger so the net effect is LNER's got better and you've got better because more people are traveling. And that is as a result of having open access competition on the on the line. Pretty much it. Yeah, absolutely. Because we think that we're helping fuel an overall growth of the market that is more than compensating for any movement between uh, operators with choice. Uh, it's helping keep fares keener for customers. It's attracting more customers to rail. And that's why I talk about us as open access playing a part of, of the wider uh, rail mix um, in terms of making rail more attractive to, to, to more people. You know, and that, that's being replicated in, 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 in places beyond the UK. Uh, there's some great case studies in Italy and Spain as well, uh, where the incumbent state-owned operators are, are actually saying, quite openly now, yeah, we're, we're welcoming this challenge to us. It's, it's sharpening up what we do, and it's, and it's growing customer numbers for all operators. OK, Let, let's move on to an, another point, right? So this point is around access charges and what we now have is the infrastructure cost charge because the argument was always leveled at open access oh yes terrific but that's just top line they're not actually paying their way they're only paying variable track access now clearly the icc the infrastructure cost charge is designed to address that um but again you, you don't pay it for the first two years i know i know lumo is now paying it right but you don't pay it for the first two years then it's 25 percent. then it's 50 percent. so it's year five before you're making a, a meaningful contribution to variable track access. So again, why is that not a subsidy? Certainly, if not in year five, certainly in the first four years. Well, look, open access model has been going now for, for nearly 25 years. Um, and uh, with that, I think we can see there's a whole wider range of benefits that it brings. It's uh, and, and, and yeah, I think it's also fair to say that, that you know, the costs of the railway infrastructure do not go up pro rata per train or per train passenger. Um, so, you know, it, it is right and proper that, that, that we frame that accordingly. The bulk of the operators that are paying both variable and fixed price, uh, fixed, fixed track access charges are, of course, now in receipt themselves of huge amounts of government subsidy. Um, many of them were always net subsidy tox rather than premium paying tox anyway. I get that long distance historically used to be a premium paying uh, situation. So yeah, we, we need to think about the wider uh, area of where the money is coming from. Where we sit today, um, you know, we are the only operator on the East Coast Main Line that is not in receipt of any uh, public subsidies at all directly. Um, I get your point about track access charges. However, there is, as you now say, the infrastructure capacity charge that's phased in over that five year period. And, and that reflects that there's obviously huge startup costs that go into setting up a brand new train operation. Trains aren't cheap, um, but also that your business case will see a gradual growth um, of customer numbers from, from you, know, you don't just fill your trains up from day one that, that you hit the tracks. Um, but actually, when that's fully phased in on Lumo, we will be paying more per passenger journey um, than, than any other operator on the East Coast Main Line in terms of track access charges. So I think there's a, there's a balance of you know, the old traditional open access model, which was about um, a form, I would like to call it, of levelling up, if you like, better connecting underserved or, 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 or not served at all areas. So this has been of huge benefit to places like Hull that only have one direct train a day to London. It now has eight. Um, Grand Central's done the same on, on the routes down from Sunderland and from Bradford. Uh, Lumo's better connecting more from Stevenage, um, but actually reflecting that Lumo has, for the first time, I think, really taken open access into areas where people may have said, well, it already has a, uh, a sufficient train service, such as um, Edinburgh or uh, Newcastle. Well, actually, guess what? Once that's gone in there, it's grown customer numbers exponentially. It's added more value. Um, and yeah, there's the infrastructure, uh, the ICC charge um, that, that, that comes in reflecting that that, that is a market um, that, that, that can bear that in, in, in terms of the economics of it all. 
track access charges is just one dynamic of the economics. Oh, no, I, 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 I accept that, Martin. It is one part of it. But but when you take each individual part and you can kind of break it down, it does add up then to you know a, a, a bigger picture. I mean, it is a challenge talking about track access and premium and subsidy tox because obviously nev- network rails revenue support grant has rather change the picture of you know who who pays premium and who doesn't pay premium so it, it, there's a little bit apples and pears comparisons if we're not careful but nonetheless whilst taking your point about setup costs that icc you, you still get a leg up i don't necessarily mean you per se but you still get a leg up in the first few years and not only that if i understand it it, it, it only applies if one of the stations served on route is i think is it at least 15 million um, passengers going through that stage uh, station each year. So there are some open access op- operators who may not even pay it at all. Now, I know you are, but that's, again, you know, you can see why there's that sort of sense. It's not an entirely level playing field. But let, let's just talk about enhancement because you've um, you mentioned there about, uh, you know, sort of paying for enhancements for the network. ICC deals with, if you like, maintenance renewals but the network needs enhancement right north of newcastle you've got restriction on the power supply but you're not going to pay anything towards that so who pays for that then well we, 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 we're we paying no more or no less than than any other rail operator in terms of into that sort of things you, you you don't uh yeah you do see incremental improvement schemes funded by tox and proportionally uh we have our own versions of that so we've just renewed uh, the platform surface and and uh, station fencing at Howden. That's a £1.2 million investment on the part of whole trains. It's a good example of an open access operator investing in infrastructure. Grand Central did a very transformational project um, in Wakefield. Uh, we've got, uh, we will be announcing our committee schemes at Lumo very soon as well. So I think it's unfair to say that open access isn't paying into the, the sort of infrastructure renewals piece. You know, I, I would like to think that those numbers are certainly proportional uh, to any sort of commitment that you'll see from other passenger tops um, or freight operators in, in into uh, improving the, the oh, wider area. But also... Oh, hang on a minute, because that's ever so slightly, that could be taken the, the wrong way. I'm not, I wouldn't dispute it at a TOC account level, but, but LNER is owned by the Department of Transport. So the Department of Transport is picking up the bill for premiums as well it might be through a different route as opposed to going through a talk but to take take the specific example you would love i know because we've, we've talked about this before you'd love to have a strengthened power supply north of newcastle to be able to run more trains right well 10 car trains actually longer trains longer trains well we'll come back to capacity management uh, yeah. we'll come to capacity yeah. management in a minute longer trains absolutely brilliant um would you be prepared then to pay a fair contribution towards the the infrastructure cost of upgrading that power supply. Well, we'd potentially be paying more in-track access charges if, if it was a charging regime that was based on vehicle lengths, as, as, as some of them traditionally have been. Um, I think that's a discussion we'd, we, 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 we'd need to be having. You know, there is an acceptance in the UK, and, 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 and Hugh Merriman, you know, the outgoing rail minister, obviously mentioned it in, in, in his interview review that, that you know there's a there's a five-year control period settlement for network rail. I think the number was something like forty-one billion pound that he quoted, which, which, which is actually the, the sort of UK government commitment to uh, the infrastructure. As I said earlier, that the costs of running the infrastructure don't go up incrementally in both fixed and variable track access charges based on the number of trains that you run. It, it, you know, the, 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 there's an element of genuine fixed costs there. Um, open access operators are not uh, shy from, from contributing to, to infrastructure schemes. We're certainly not... Uh, um, you know, saying that we that we aren't uh, investing in the infrastructure, we absolutely do. And, I, and I, I, I firmly believe that if if you look at both the earlier open access operators in terms of the wider economic benefits that they brought to the areas that they they, they serve, better connectivity, um, new jobs. You know, that's a massive thing. We've got 125 people in Hull um, that, that 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 have in direct employment from us, and we're investing in their skills and development, yeah. um, and want and, to expand and, and grow that. And, and that is terrific. I'm sorry, just let, let's just um, there's a couple of other quick ones, if if, if we may. So mm. capacity, you mentioned that briefly. A yeah. five car unit uh, unit taking up what is a valuable commodity, which is a slot on the East Coast Main Line. That can't be the most efficient use of capacity, surely. What what can be done about that? Well, I think we, firstly, it's really important that we're making sure that that capacity is also fair for the communities that are served. So actually. 
um, it may well be the case that some of the uh, routes that served off of the East Coast Main Line by some of the open access operators, such as, um, you know, let's take Grand Central, for example, to, to Sunderland or to Bradford, um, really important that those communities are linked, as it is for us at Whole Trains that Hull is linked. If those markets can only support um, demand for a five-car uh, train, you know, none of them are on clock face hourly timetables. So I think there is a balance to be said to make sure that capacity is proportional um, to those communities, um, those regions that are served. Um, but but actually, you know, here with with with, with the two organisations I represent, uh, we're certainly not saying that we just want to sit at, at, at five car pass. Yeah, you know, we've just mentioned Lumo. Yeah, you know, we 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 would have, uh, I'm sure, by now, place an order for new trains uh, to to grow what we do here if we weren't capacity constrained in terms of the electrical supply system um, between Morpeth and, and Edinburgh, and and you know, look, that's still being looked at. And an increasing number of whole trains journeys are already ten cars. So actually, that's one carriage more than many other operators on the route. So um, I would say that open access is actually on a pathway. Um, to bring even better utilisation. So, uh, final point. Um, in At the moment, performance on the network's not good enough, right? There is, there's pockets of fabulous work going on. Never dispute that. But overall, it's not good enough. And there is a view, it's certainly one that I promoted, that there needs to be a bit more slightly old-fashioned, if I can call it that, approach, directing mind, people call it, to sorting out some core performance issues. How does open access operate in that world? Because there is a danger, is there not, that everybody turns up waving their track access agreement and say, well, uh, you don't tell me what I can and can't do. Um, here's my contract. How do we manage our way through th that new reality of needing to get a grip on performance network-wide? Well, look, my very early background in my career is, is, is in timetabling, and, and so I have an absolute appreciation for the importance of the timetable. And, and you know, I'd like to think that how we operate here, I just mentioned that we picked up some, some really good accolades in terms of lowest talk on self-delays, um, and we've got a great performing fleet, thanks to our work with Hitachi. So we are very focused on making sure we play our part in delivering a reliable railway. Um, we aren't an organisation that, that sits around and waves that, that, that contract, but equally it's really important that we do protect um, the services that we've worked hard to build up, particularly places like Hull, where, where you know we, we, we are the, the only operator for many journeys for, for customers. Um, I think there needs to be a, a, you know, a, 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 a holistic view, but it does need to be collaborative with people working together. I, I, I get slightly nervous when we talk about sort of, um, you know, controlling minds. I hope that they can be more guiding than controlling. We do have a vibrant mix um, of different types of operators. Freight is a really important part of that mix and, and, and a yeah, complicated yeah. Uh, thing that needs to be weaved into to, to timetabling and operating planning. For me, it's really important that we don't lose sight of the customer in all of this. That's why we're ultimately here is for our customers and, and a big, you know, we as an open access operator, you know, no subsidy, fully commercially exposed. Um, you know, we live or die by giving a good experience to our customers. Um, and it's really, really important to me that, that, that in a wider industry timetabling process, we make sure yeah. that we are absolutely prioritizing, uh, all of our customers across all the regions. So, no, I, I, absolutely, no disagreement with that. It, it has to be customer focused, and and um, yeah, we are we are in strong strong agreement on that. Look, we're, we're, we're all there. So there you have it, some lively stuff. Um, and don't forget, the full interview will be on Spotify audio wise, and it will be on YouTube for the full video experience from monday the 17th so do catch up with that it is really worth listening to so richard um i think your biggest beef with open access having listened to you opine on it quite a bit recently um abstraction seems to be one of the big ones for you do you want to tell us what you think about that yeah i would say i i, I say abstraction and um basically paying their way really those those are sort of two things so look you i mean you you, you heard what he said he he is very um he does have an answer for absolutely everything which is which is great really i mean you wouldn't expect anything else when i asked him about abstraction he focused almost entirely on orcats right which is the system that allocates revenue between operators for these inter available tickets and he said it's not really that big a thing anymore because with Long distance operators, the vast majority of tickets are um, uh, sort of advanced purchase. They're not inter available, they're specific to the operator. So it was almost like, so ORCATS really isn't that big an issue. But actually, it's not just about ORCATS, it's being there 
at all um, will cause people to move from operator B A to operator B, and that is abstractive. Now, the open access operators say, yeah, well, that's because we're better or cheaper or whatever. Um, Martin's better than that. What he says is, and I'd be fascinated in your thoughts on this because I, I don't know, I've got my own views. His really entire thesis is that, yep, yeah, we are abstracting passengers from LNER, no question. But the total market has grown bigger than the abstraction because we're there as an open access operator. So in other words, yes, we've taken some passengers from L and ER, but they've not really noticed that because they've got, they've not only got them back, they've got more because the total market's grown and that's come about through competition. Discuss. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, knowing your propensity for wanting the forensic detail, my immediate question is, are the numbers to prove that? Um, because surely there must be some if, if he's right. It sounds to me, and it's just feeling that it's stretching a point. Well, the, the, I think the real problem is you can't ever prove it. it, it you can, because you know, the market grows to whatever the market grows to, and how much of it was due to factor A or factor B or factor C becomes very, very difficult to uh, disaggregate. So I don't think you can really say, I mean, it might be because there was competition. It might just be because it, it's bounced back faster and better anyway. We know L and E are a good operator. So it's very difficult to disaggregate that. And the other problem with it is it's it's a gamble, isn't it? If you if you approve an open access operator, what if it doesn't happen like that? Um, you only know after the point at which you've made the commitment. So um, look, I there's no doubt that on the East Coast main line, you've got some really good operators on there. And Luma and Hull Trains are good operators, let's be very clear. Mm. Um, but so is LNER. So quite what the variable is causing this, I think it's very difficult to say. But he does accept it is abstractive. Um, he just he just points out that he's made the he's helped make the market bigger, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, when is a subsidy not a subsidy uh, with regard to things like ICC? And you can explain the alphabet soup. Yeah. Uh, but this was a classic. I think this was Martin at what I can now see is his classic best. Yeah. Uh, is giving fantastic answers, none of which were really in answer yeah, to the question one, you'd asked. Yeah, it, absolutely. And this one did actually no, oh, frustrate me really, but it was, I thought, mm, this is interesting. So ICC, if you're not, if you, if you're not aware, um, came about, it's called infrastructure cost charge, and it's an attempt um, to ensure that the open access operator is paying a fair share of its access to the network. So back in the day when open access first started, they only paid variable track access charges. They didn't pay a contribution towards the fixed cost. But the ICC is designed, has come in now, and it's designed to ensure that the open access operator is paying a bit more towards the, them being there. And I pointed out, um, it doesn't kick in for the first two years, right? Then it's only 25%. Then it's 50%. Martin's answer to that was, yeah, well, it takes time to build up these open access op open access operators, which, yeah, fine. But you're still getting a leg up. It's still subsidy. And he answered it and he said, well, open access has been going 25 years and it's about a wider range of benefits. Well, that's got nothing to do with ICC. The costs of rail infrastructure do not go up pro rata per train or per train passenger. Yeah, well, interesting, but not really about the subsidy point. And the bulk of operators are paying fixed and variable track access charges and now in receipt of huge amounts of government subsidy. How the how the government choose to channel money through train operators or direct to network rail through a revenue support grant is kind of, you know, well, that's up to the government, really. I, I don't feel that we really got to the bottom of that one, which no. is a bit of a shame. But but look, I I... I think the he said he said we're the only operator not on the east coast not in receipt of public subsidy at all directly right directly which I thought was very interesting so you know not indirect for me this is all indirect stuff the abstraction is really an indirect thing uh, ICC's issues are indirect so yeah they're not getting a check from the government but but they're avoiding cost potentially right um 
and that is indirect. So, look, um, there were loads of other points he made, Nigel. He talked about the fair use of capacity, which, I, again, I thought was a bit a slightly odd one because he talked, well, we talked about Worksop um, and Morpeth. And these are important places, but you're not telling me that the market, the flow, the value of the revenue flow from Worksop to London is the same as some of the really big ones. Of course it's not. So fairness has got to be proportional to the market. And back in British Rail days, they understood you put all the effort and all the money into your big flows because that's what ultimately generated generated the money. The money. Exactly. So I, what I, I thought was yeah, interesting. What I thought was interesting was when you asked him about congestion. Yeah. Um, and his answer was along the lines of, well, no, we're not, you know, we're not going to turn up waving our contract around and and that's what we're entitled to and that's what we're having. But then he said, but we're not going to give up trains for which we've fought quite hard, which sounded like exactly what he's going to do somehow. Yeah, I mean, look at private company. He's got to protect his commercial yeah. interests and that's, but, you yeah, know, I, I kind of had the same sort of. And the enhancement right. question, my ears pricked up when you asked him if he'd pay a contribution towards upgrading power supplies north of Newcastle in particular, because he couldn't run more trains until that, that's done. Um, and I thought you got a fairly dusty answer to that, didn't you? We made the point, which is, let's be balanced, that they do contribute to smaller scheme upgrades uh, on the stations that they serve, and that's that's absolutely fine. But I do think the point about enhancement is critical because, you know, um, it's the DFT that pays for those. Yeah, so um, whether it goes through train operators or direct into network rail, it's still public money that's paying for those um, upgrades and the cost of access should arguably reflect um, a share of the benefit that comes from those upgrades. I, I thought it was a really interesting thing he said towards the end, and I'm sure you picked it up. He said, open access is a good counterbalance and calibrator to prevent us becoming a one dimension railway, a good healthy thing to have a small bit of competition in the market. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, you can see how a bit of small, you know, grit uh, keeps everybody on their toes. It's when it starts to becoming a matter of big scale where I think these questions of access charges and abstraction become very serious. They do. But look, let's let's sort of move towards rounding this up. It sounds as though we're being a bit critical of him there, and I'm genuinely not. I was hugely impressed with him. His enthusiasm, passion, determination commitment you know tick 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 and i thought he was an outstanding ambassador for the railway you know passionate very customer focused um obviously he's seen things and articulating it at the moment from an open access point of view but he can't do anything else i think the key words in my last comment were at the moment because i watched that interview thinking what are you going to be doing in the future um on the new railway it strikes me that there's going to be opportunity a big opportunity probably for somebody like martin or for martin um and it's going to be interesting to see um where he winds up isn't it if i was chief executive of great british railways he'd be well up the top of my um target list of people yeah it, no, he is he's out, outstanding um and uh you know i didn't i didn't feel he was evasive i, I no. did th i did think he was you know, he did answer a slightly different question at times, but you know, we've all we've all done that. You know, guilty as charged. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he used to do it with me on rail all the time, Richard. all the time, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, but he's passionate, he's committed, he's smart, and they do run a great service. And his his obsession with customer focus is brilliant. I I would just love to see that applied to, you know. 1500 trains a day <laughs> that's all which is why i say there's a job for him on the on the bigger yeah. scale yeah probably fairly soon yeah um so it's going to be really interesting to um to watch all <laughs> to smile at the end where he was determined to have the last word with you and i was determined to make sure he did <laughs> he, he 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 didn't no absolutely you'll have to listen to the full interview to hear that actually because because yeah. in the bit that we've just shown um we just picked out those big headlines but, but you, you were listen... doing your best to wind it up and he <laughs> kept leaving <up. laughs> it was it was quite hilarious actually but he, listen i'll tell you what he gets 10 out of 10 and he definitely wins the prize for getting the most amount of key messages into an interview and a, a, a very cool backdrop so well done martin it shall was a we, very cool backdrop it was shall we move on to the quiz i i think that's a great idea richard as usual i'm looking forward to the quiz 
Um, <laughs> it was a quite straightforward one this week. Even I knew the answer at the time you asked it. Oh, blimey, was it that straightforward? It oh, was. Right. <laughs> Cheek. Um, right, okay, here we go. Lobbing this one back over the net. I hugely, hugely enjoyed the comment from Karen Turner. So well done, Karen, on YouTube, who said, by the way, I know the answer to the quiz. I won't enter, enter, being as it's far too easy. Even Richard can't mess this one up. Yeah. Can I tell everybody, right, the only thing that Nigel's been talking about for about the last four days in preparation for this recording is that comment so yeah thank you so much karen you know you've uh, you've 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 made him very happy and uh, steph and i have had to listen to that about a million times yeah let's point out steph spotted it and she thought it was a hoot too uh, you are in so much trouble now for dobbing her in anyway let's let's remind well, she's used uh, to that <laughs> let's remind ourselves what the question was the question was where was the old worse and worse and of course it was dead easy the answer was the oxford worcester and wolverhampton railway which of course you can still ride on the vast majority of it um from um, oxford to worcester uh on the cotswold line and then of course uh, from to up to birmingham via kidderminster so uh a dead easy one um the winner uh, loads and loads and loads of people answered it because it was easy. And I'm delighted to say the winder, winner is um, Andrew Pennington, who, of course, um, was on the show a few oh, weeks ago. Oh, he was, Yeah, yes, we yes. interviewed him um, at Southwestern Railway. So, um, so Andrew, do send us another email uh, on Info at Green Signals to tell us where you would like your mug sent, and we'll get it on its way to you. Um, this week's quiz, probably a bit harder. I don't know now. Um, but it's this. Who described what as an act of malice and philistinism so who who so a person described what as an act of malice and philistinism I now if you think you know guess, but... if you think you know please email us your answer to info at greensignals.org or put the comment on youtube if you don't want anybody to know then you need to send an email um uh, don't you don't have to be first Right, we've we changed that. You do have to let us know by midday on Saturday, so you've got forty eight hours to and go into means, the hat, and then it goes into the hat, and we pick one out at random, and uh, it's all very proper. Um, and then we will announce the win on next week's show. But uh, you don't have to be first; you but you do have to get us an answer um, by midday on Saturday. Good luck, indeed. So let's move on to some good news, shall we? I was really pleased to see that the Ecclesbourne Valley Railway in Derbyshire is due to fully reopen this week. It had been partially closed for seven months because of a serious landslip at the Duffield end, I believe. Um, and what has been called a triumph of community spirit and engineering expertise means services set to resume on Friday, June 14th. Trains have been running from Worksworth and terminating at Duffield Holloway Road. But providing a final testing has all gone well, services can resume to Duffield Station proper, the Junction Station with the main line, of course, with a Back to the 40s event this weekend. Extensive repairs have been needed, both from expert track engineers and a passionate team of volunteers to get the line back up and running, which is excellent news. And we wish them a great first weekend back in operation and many more to follow. The Ecclesbourne Valley Railway, I, I like it a lot. It's it's not got a very high profile um, and deserves more attention. A few years ago, they didn't have their own steam locomotives. And um, as a director of Loughborough Standard Locomotives Group, they asked if they could borrow one of our class twos. But they didn't have drivers or firemen or crews, so we all trotted along to to the to the railway. And we did some route learning in the DMU, and I had two fantastic weekends driving on that railway, which is really interesting. Very friendly people, and of course, it's got the branch at the top end up to the old quarries, which is enormously steep. So it's um, it's really well here's, worth. Here's an unusual thing. Then, I sorry, can say, I can say this: we have both driven on uh, a train down the Ecclesbourne Valley Railway. Oh, there we go. Because my father, for my 50th birthday, um, bought me a DMU driving experience. So I drove that bubble car um, All right. unit um, up and down it a few times. It is so, absolutely a lovely railway. It's very attractive. Um, this piece of this piece of work is, is quite serious. They've had to slew the track. It's been, mm. It was quite a thing. So well done to them. It's great. 
So that was a good 15 years or so ago then, Richard. It, you know, sometimes I, I yeah, cruising for a bruising, I think, is the expression that my certainly my kids use. But yeah, anyway, I will get my own back. I will get my own back. You frequently do. Oh, I. And sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. As usual, thanks so much for watching or listening, whatever platform, whether it's audio or video on YouTube. Please don't forget to give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Leave a comment. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. It really does help. And most of all, join us again next week. But for now, it's goodbye from me in Lincolnshire. And and it's goodbye from me. Thanks ever so much for being with us. See you soon. Mm-hmm.